I want to thank everyone so much for being here or being wherever you are <laughs> since we can't be together, but this is the next best thing. So thanks for making the time to, um, to come to the party. Um, I'd also like to thank your dog's friend and Deborah for everything they do. Um, and especially for giving me a chance to talk about one of my very favorite subjects and dive down deep into one of my favorite rabbit holes, which is where behavior issues come from and why is my dog like this? Um, I don't know if you just heard my dog whining outside. Hopefully someone will come and take care of her. Um, otherwise you may hear her again. Um, but anyway, so yeah, my name is Karen. Um, I have a small business called Eager Beagle Dog Training. I love working with dogs who have some, you know, issues and baggage. Um, I get kind of bored just doing manners. So I like to work with dogs who, you know, who've had some struggles. Um, and I think, um, you know, I've, I've been doing dog training since around 2011, but um, I've been interested in behavior, my animal behavior my whole life. So again, it's, it's really exciting for me to be able to dig down into this subject. And I'm gonna be presenting a lot of other people's research. Um, so, and just giving you the general conclusions, but we'll have a chance later to talk about how um, you can get more information on the, on these, uh, on the on this information. So, um, yeah. So, if you have adopted a shelter or rescue dog, I'm guessing if you're anything like me, you've made up this backstory for them to explain all their quirks and all their glitches. And we'll probably never know the whole truth. Um, in fact, the factors that shape a dog's personality and behavior are so much more complex and far reaching than most of us could ever imagine. Um, and I'm guessing that you guys have dogs with at least some of these problems. If you don't, good, good for you, good for your dog. But we're gonna be talking about, you know, some of the factors that can cause these kinds of, of issues. Uh, so I wanna just orient you a little bit to the broad, um, areas that we're going to be covering. And I'm going to take these one by one. And so we're going to look at genetics. We'll look at the prenatal period before puppies are even born, their earliest weeks of life, uh, the importance of socialization and the fallout from lack of socialization. And then um, we'll talk a little bit about the effects of trauma and chronic stress on behavior. And um, I want to just give you a little bit bit of a recommendation about the chat. Like Deborah said, if you have a, a need for clarification about something I said, if it doesn't make sense or you're wondering if you interpreted it right, go ahead and you know get in there and ask the question and I'll try to get to it right away. And then if you have a question of more general nature, I'll try to stop at certain periods, uh, periodically at certain like pauses, natural pauses along the way, and we can get to those questions then. Okay, so let's start with genetics. Um, we all know that DNA, you know, plays a role in um, in our dog's behavior, in their temperament. Um, but what about behavior problems? And we actually have, I don't know, something like more than 70 years of research on canine genetics that show that, yeah, these um, some of these behavior problems are just passed down from from the parents to the puppies and they just come that way. Um, and some of these traits that are heritable are fearfulness, impulsivity, and aggression. So basically a dog's DNA sort of sets the parameters for their temperament, but then their dog, your dog's behavior is gonna be shaped by everything that happens to them throughout their life. And that actually starts even before they're born. Um, so what happens to mama dog when she's pregnant is another piece of this puzzle of, you know, why is my dog like this? Um, the mama dog in this photo, I love her face. I think this dog has not a care in the world. Um, but maybe your dog's mama was, um, 
you know, living as a stray. Um, maybe she was on the streets, you know, maybe she was hungry or, you know, hungry and malnourished. Maybe she had heartworm and she was sick. Maybe she was chained out in the backyard all alone. Maybe she was cold or hot or all these things. And if the mother's, the mother dog's stress hormones are elevated during her pregnancy, then the puppies that gr are growing inside her, their brains are getting this chemical message that the world is a threatening place and they better be ready to take on some danger. So that sets them up with, you know, a certain uh, vigilance already. And so the impact on puppies' behavior, if their mom has been stressed, the research suggests that they are more likely to be fearful. They're more likely to be reactive. They're more likely to be anxious and they're less likely to be sociable and friendly and, you know, gregarious and extroverted. The reason I use this photo is this is just a litter of puppies that I met when I was uh, working at the Washington DC shelter a few years ago. And we knew something about them. We knew the parents, they were owner surrenders. They'd been born in the backyard, you know, backyard breeding operation. And they were all fearful, you know, at a time in a puppy's development when you'd expect them to be bold and inquisitive, or at least, you know, not cowering in the corner, they were all afraid. And, you know, was this because of prenatal stress? I don't know, but it certainly could be a factor. Um, and it, based on what we knew about the situation, I think it probably was. So then um, as soon as a puppy's born, their behavior really starts getting shaped by their circumstances. And, you know, things like, what kind of maternal care did they get? Um, were they an only child? Doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen and it has an effect. And um, were they maybe taken from their mom and their litter too early? So this is an interesting question, I think. Is there such a thing as a bad mom? I think that's unfair, like we can't really judge that. But um, this question was posed in Sweden in this um, breeding program for military working dogs. They looked at the first three weeks of puppies' lives and they looked at how engaged, how nurturing the mother was with them. And the way they measured that was to um, record how much time she spent lying in contact with her puppies and nursing them and licking them and sniffing and nuzzling them and just, you know, really like being um, attending to them. And what they found was the mothers who were the most attentive had puppies who grew up to be friendlier, less easily spooked and startled and bolder, just more likely to want to kind of interact with the world. So it makes you wonder what kind of mom your puppy, your dog had. Um, this is something that doesn't happen a lot, okay? Most dogs will not be born into a litter of, uh, uh, will not be a litter of one, but it does happen that a mom will have one puppy or only one puppy will survive. And um, this can be a problem because not having siblings and not having to deal with siblings, not having to get along with them, wait their turn, you know, for nursing or for whatever they want, um, not learning how to play nice. They can grow up kind of bratty and actually have this syndrome that we call singleton syndrome. And these puppies tend to grow up into dogs who have kind of low impulse control, um, poor bite inhibition. They don't have great social skills. They don't really know how to get along with other dogs, and they even might be sensitive to touch because they didn't grow up under a pile of other puppies. Um, so, and then this is a big one. Um, I never really understood that this kind of thing happens a lot, but when I was working at the Washington DC shelter, we had a lot of dogs who came in um, as owner surrenders and they're in their home or her home. And 
we would find that people had adopted it or bought a dog at four or five weeks of age. And, you know, experts agree that um, eight weeks is really the minimum amount of time that a puppy should spend with the mom in the litter. And during that time, the mom is teaching her puppies, you know, just how to be a, a good a good dog. And when they step out of line, she'll discipline them a little bit with a grumble or a little nip. And that's how they learn to just, you know, behave themselves. Um, they also internalize her reactions to things. So if she takes things in stride, they're gonna notice. If she's easily startled by a, a loud sound or a, some kind of like a new person, they also internalize that. So those are all kinds of lessons. Um, oh, hi, Jen. <laughs> Um, lessons they learn from mom. And then what do the litter mates teach each other? They teach each other, don't bite too hard. They teach each other, wait your turn. I'm, I'm still nursing and there aren't enough teats for all of us. Um, they learn how to get along with each other, how to get along with other dogs, how to play fair. So if they're missing those lessons, what might happen? Um, we can see these kinds of impacts on their behavior. The research show, gives us evidence that these are things that may happen. The reason I use this picture is this is Pepper. She's a dog I got to know at the Washington DC shelter. Um, and we know for a fact that she was taken from her mom at five weeks. And I will tell you, she had every single problem on this list. Is that the only reason? I don't know, probably not, but it certainly couldn't have helped. Okay, so let's turn to socialization. This one is, um, I think this definition is sometimes, uh, the definition of this term can be confusing because when we talk about socialization, we're, we think we're talking about parties and playdates, but when we use this term in canine behavior, we're really talking about um, exposure to new things and making those exposures a positive experience. There's this period of time early in a dog's life from maybe about three weeks, you know, just after their eyes open, until maybe 12, maybe 13, 14 weeks, not much more than that, where the, their little brains are just like sponges and they are especially receptive during this period to all kinds of information about the world and all that data, all the stimuli, all the new things that they see experience that happened to them, they're all uploaded into a database in their brain, basically that forms a picture of what is normal. And then after that window closes, the things that have, they have not experienced, that have not been uploaded into their brains as normal, those things are unfamiliar. They're new, they're not normal to the puppy, to the dog, and therefore they're a potential threat. This is just a survival instinct. It's part of normal development that animals will learn something that doesn't look like what they expect is a potential threat and they should stay away. So it's a, it's a normal thing, but that's why we want to expose our puppies to as much as, or our dogs as, to as much as we can when they're in this critical period. Unfortunately, if you have a shelter or rescue dog, you probably weren't in their life at that early stage. And we don't know what happened to them and what they, who they met and what they saw. Um, you probably can't see this very well. And I apologize for, you're never supposed to include a slide that your, you know, your like audience can't read, but I'll let you know just a few of the things that, um, that uh, let's see. They should meet, you know, men with beards. They should meet people with hats, sunglasses. They should meet people of other races, you know, especially with dark skin, because that will look different. Um, if they can see a person who has an unusual gait, that's helpful because if a pup, if a dog sees a person with 
a limp or, you know, a cane or something later and they have never seen this before, they're going to, they're probably going to, you know, bark at them or be afraid. Um, they should see tall people. They should climb stairs. They should experience what it's like to have a garbage truck rumble by. Um, sirens, people on bikes, skateboards, those kinds of things. I, I even saw one of these lists, a client showed me, um, hot air balloon. So, I mean, in, maybe it was in New Mexico, I don't know, but I, I have never seen a air, hot air balloon, so my dog hasn't either. Um, so what happens to our dogs who haven't seen a lot? You know, when we when we bring these dogs home, these shelter and rescue dogs who have, you know, grew up in the country or they were chained in the backyard, they really, for whatever reasons, they didn't see much. They didn't get out much as puppies. They didn't really see much of the world. They didn't meet very many people. And so when we bring them home with us, this is their first rodeo. They did just fall off the turnip truck. A lot of them just they they're naive to a lot of what they um, they find in their surroundings now. And that can be a little overwhelming. Um, if a dog has never seen, say, a person with dark skin or someone who limps or an umbrella or all of these things, those are unfamiliar and they're going to process it as a potential threat. Um, they're going to be afraid of like normal stuff that you don't think they should be afraid of, but they are. And that's just how it is until they may uh, become habituated. I, I got my dog when she was about six months old and, you know, she used to bark at people carrying a recycling bin or people with like a black coat with a hood with sunglasses. And over time, she just got used to it. So some dogs will habituate. Some dogs are more resilient than others. They'll habituate. They'll see Oh yeah, there's another person with a, there's another, you know, figure approaching with a hood and a sunglasses. And I know that this is another, you know, version of a human and that's just part of life. But other dogs will not habituate. They will become sensitized. And every time they encounter something that's scary, they're going to have even more of a reaction. Um, and this is especially true of adolescent dogs, the teenagers. Um, and that period is somewhere between six months to maybe up to two years. This is when a lot of dogs end up in the shelter, you might have noticed. Um, so in adolescence, during that period, the brain is in a state where it ha is more likely to become sensitized. So dogs who are adolescents who have not had a lot of socialization early in life are more likely to you know, have, they're, they're less likely to habituate and they're more likely to have a, re a reaction that escalates um, over time to things that you wish they would just realize are normal part of life. Okay, and the last thing I wanna cover in part one is um, trauma and chronic stress. So as dogs grow up, um, stress and trauma can really pile up and and just do a number on their brains. Um, this is just a list. It's not a complete list, unfortunately. It's it's uh, this is a long one, long list of things that can really um, stress a dog out as they're growing up. Um, there, these are just examples of things that uh, have happened to dogs that I have known. So life is a stray. We know that's tough. Um, we don't know what it feels like, but we know that's got to leave a mark. Um, injury, disease. Uh, we had a lot of dogs. I've I've done a lot of work with shelters, and you know we see these tripods who've been hit by a car while they were running at large in the street and have to have an amputation, and that's got to be traumatic. We just you know, and there's disease, there's mange, there's even rescues um, who are. I see a lot of dogs now being pulled from um, uh, from Texas and. That's a long drive, you know. It's a it's, it's great intentions, but for some dogs, that long journey is going to be tough, and it's going to take them a while to recover from it. Um, life in a shelter, being abandoned, being rehomed lots of times, being attacked by a dog. These are all being trained with a shock collar. Um, 
shot by the police. We saw a lot of that in DC. It's terrible to say, but that just that's just another thing that can traumatize a dog. Dogs who were in fighting rings, dogs who were from a meat farm in South Korea, which are more and more being shut down. Uh, so when there is a lot of stress um, and potentially trauma in a dog's past, it really, um, it really messes with their brain. It changes the way their brain works. Uh, they have higher levels of stress hormones. Their baseline level of cortisol and adrenaline are just, they're just higher. They never go back to kind of a normal state. Um, their brain's stress response network, the part of the brain, the network in the brain that kind of, you know, deals, copes with stress is just, it becomes completely dysregulated, dysfunctional. They just can't, they can't deal with stress in a normal way. They become hyperreactive. Little things set them off. They react for a longer period of time. It takes them much longer to kind of come back to baseline to settle down. They're hypervigilant. They're always on guard. Um, they may be impulsive. They may be aggressive. And they're more likely to become sensitized to triggers. And that's not to say that every dog is going to have all of these problems. Um, but research shows us that these are things that are likely to, um, that some of these things are likely to show up in, in some of these dogs, probably all of these dogs. So um, let's pause here because this is the part where I'm gonna start talking about things that we can do to help our dogs. And I wanna pause and see what um, what questions I might be able to answer at this point or what things we might wanna discuss before we move on. Um, one question is whether there's scientific research about the impact of chronic stress, the cortisol levels and so on. There is, um, I have, you know, funny thing about COVID is I hate it and it's terrible, but one silver line is I've been able to attend a lot more, you know, meetings and scientific conferences. Um, and I have taken all this, all these um, results from research um, done by people like, uh, gosh, Christina Spaulding and, um, Dr. Christopher Packle, who's a behavior, a, a veterinary behaviorist. And those are, they're people who have done their own research or, or they, they have, you know, cited the research of other people. So there is a lot out there. I do want to point out, there are studies that I have um, kind of touched on that were done on other species. And scientists are pretty comfortable saying it's likely the case across all mammals because mammals brains are so similar their structures are similar their neurotransmitters work the same way um their stress response network is consistent across so we can make some assumptions and we can't necessarily prove them but we can speculate that the something that's true of a mouse and a monkey is probably also true of a dog um, and because the purpose of this uh, discussion is really to, to just kind of help us think maybe, maybe this could be an explanation, maybe that could be an explanation, and just look at the whole kind of spectrum of things that can, can act upon our dog's brain development and the, therefore their behavior. Um, I haven't included, I went back and forth a lot about whether I should like cite the specific people's research and I decided to leave it out. But if you have specific questions about the research, where, where you know, who's doing this research, um, we could probably um, connect offline somehow and I can point you to those sources. Jane wants to know if it's too late at 18 weeks to socialize more with dogs if the dog is already not getting along with other dogs, is fearful. Yeah. Um, we're going to cover that to some extent in the next part. But what I would say about that is that window, you know, that critical period of development has probably ended. Um, and that doesn't mean it's too late, but it does mean that you want to be really careful about um, how you orchestrate 
those those kind of introductions on leash we'll talk about this but on leash it's going to be a lot more challenging um and then there are ways to introduce dogs that that give them a lot of um kind of control and choices about whether they want to interact i would never force dogs to interact if they don't seem to want to um but it's it's not easy. it's just it takes uh, and then trainer might be able to help you kind of negotiate that um a trainer who's got experience with you know a positive trainer who 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 works with those kinds of issues so i'd encourage you to um to look into that um penny has a dog that they've had for 10 months now <laughs> excuse me and she pees every time they come near her oh it's about two years old what uh, okay and what what else does she um I, is that all the information there is i'm just wondering is it is yeah, it just like a little city just more information sorry that's all there is now but penny can okay. give some more information and check. yeah if you can just give a little bit more information you know if if is it fear or is it just you know kind of a habit of submissive urination um and if she's still afraid after all this time then i think it's time to um if you haven't already hire a trainer and um possibly consult with a, um, a veterinary behaviorist or at least your regular vet um, we have a list of trainers and veterinary behaviors yeah. on our website. Yes. It's really important that it be someone positive or else you're going to make the fear worse. Absolutely. Some of these are, are a little specific. One wanted to know why her rescue dog is afraid of riding in a car, which... <sighs> so is mine. <laughs> <laughs> And then another is I got my rescue when she was six months. She gets very anxious when left alone or when we try to crate her. Yeah, so I would say the first the first question, I mean, I have a lot of theories about why my particular my dog is hates the car. And um I don't know. I don't know why. I wish she didn't, because it then I don't want to take her as many places. But she's kind of hyper vigilant in the car, and I have a feeling that as all these stimuli go whizzing by, you know, she's constantly scanning to see what's going to come next. And then if we were sitting still, she'd be able to kind of case the, you know, just like clear the, clear the room and figure out what's going to happen next. But because we're constantly moving, the scene is constantly changing and there's more that she has to anticipate and react to. Um, for the, dog that's anxious in the crate when you leave that's again i'm sorry to keep you know sort of kicking the can down the road and um and outsourcing but this is uh where a trainer a positive trainer who works you know one-on-one -on -one, even a separation anxiety certified trainer could um could give you the information that you need to to help your dog we have a video on our website um, specifically about separation anxiety. And I think it's called Life After COVID Separation Anxiety Issue. Oh, yeah. And anyone having that problem may want to take a look at that video. Yeah. I think that's it for now. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, where behavior problems may have come from. Um, there are so many different factors. And the fact of the matter is, by the time we get these, uh, by the time we adopt these dogs, a lot of things have happened to them and they may be fearful, they may be anxious, they may be reactive, they may be all those things, but what do we do to help them out? How do we build their resilience? How do we build trust and confidence? How do we make their lives more predictable? And how do we make their world make more sense to them? 
So I had a lot of trouble coming down with a short enough list that I thought I could cover in the time we have. These are not the only things we can do. There are so many things we can do. But I thought these are some of the things that will kind of get us, um, you know, that are they're going to make the most impact and give us kind of the most bang for the buck. So I'm going to start with, we'll talk about keeping your dog calm, and teaching them how to be calm. We'll talk about communication, consent and control, and then chances to use their nose. So we'll start with calm. A dog who is calm is able to think and learn and focus. And for all dogs, it's really important to have this ability to be calm, to stay calm and to calm themselves down. But for some dogs, this is a real struggle, you know, especially if their DNA and their life experiences have made them fearful, anxious, hypervigilant, all the rest, easily triggered. So when a dog is stressed, um, they, they're scared, they're freaking out, they're barking, they're cowering, whatever it is, they're in fight or flight mode. Um, and the part of the brain that does the thinking and the learning is switched off so that the part of the brain that is devoted to survival can do its work, which is great, except when survival isn't really in question. It's just, you know, a dog is barking because they're, they've never seen a horse or something like that. And um, so you can have too much of a good thing. So a dog that's constantly getting triggered is going to have trouble um, staying calm. And that means they're gonna have trouble thinking. They're going to have trouble learning. They're going to tr have trouble focusing, calming down, and they're going to have trouble kind of making good choices about how to behave because they're not thinking, they're just reacting. Um, and let me go back for a minute. I just want to mention, you can probably relate to this um, because we're the same way. And an example that I often think of about being in fight or flight mode and not being able to think is last year, um, my daughter and I were rear-ended in the car. Nobody was hurt. It wasn't a big deal, really, at all, except that it was so jarring. And when the police came and I had to fill out the paperwork, I couldn't do it. I mean, I could do it, but it took me so much longer than it should have because I just couldn't think straight. And I thought, this is because all the adrenaline and all the cortisol and I'm just, uh, and I'm just having trouble. I can't think straight. I can't concentrate. And then it doesn't, you know, fight or flight brain can kick in even when it's not kind of a crisis. Um, and an example is during the pandemic, you know, people have been feeling this undercurrent of worry and loneliness and just constant, you know, kind of maybe low grade stress, maybe, you know, more acute stress. But a lot of people also have been complaining about brain fog and having trouble concentrating. So, you know, so I think we can relate to it's better to stay calm than freak out. But sometimes we can't help it. Um, so one thing you can do for your dog is really try to anticipate things that might trigger them and avoid this thing called trigger stacking. Um, trigger stacking is when there's a series of triggers and these triggering encounters they're too close together there's not enough time for your dog to get back down to their baseline level of calm and i like this example because it's relevant because we just had thanksgiving um our thanksgiving was pretty quiet and there was nothing to trigger my dog but in a normal kind of um, holiday gathering you might have you might start the day with, you know, your dog is annoyed by um, a neighbor's dog barking. And then the family shows up for the turkey dinner and the kids are chasing the dog around the house. So that's another stressor. And then there's the uncle with the long beard and the glasses and that guy's scary. And he says, dogs love me. Uh, I'm going to pet you anyway, even though you're cowering in the corner. And then your cousin shows up with her boisterous dog and your dog doesn't like him and 
that's just about, that's enough. That's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Now your dog is um, past their threshold and now they're gonna flip out. They've crossed that red line. So their thinking brain has turned off and their fight or flight uh, brain is fully engaged and is in command. Um, and again, I think we can kind of understand this because um, who hasn't had a, you know, blow up or a meltdown around the holidays? We can have trigger stacking too, and um, we can have the same kind of reaction too. So what can we do to help our dogs cope with stress and learn to calm themselves? You can actually teach your dog how to be calm. And some dogs really do have to learn this. They have to learn how to just hang and enjoy doing nothing. And they have to learn that they have a choice whether they flip out or not. And it's a little bit like meditation for people. I confess I, I've tried. I, I, just, I can't. I don't like it. So, um, But the reason, I understand the reason people do it is because, or my impression is, you practice. You practice kind of clearing your mind and focusing on breathing and being calm so that you gain the skill to um, deploy it in real life, in every day, um, in, you know, make it a habit in real life. So I'm not gonna go into detail here. Um, I wish I could, but it's not, a, it's not a training class, it's just a talk. So what I've done is there's a section um, in the webinar, um, in one of those dialogue boxes that says files. And in that section, I've put a file that has links to videos and documents that I think you'll find helpful, which include the relaxation protocol and the mat work, but there's also some other stuff in there. So please do take a look and see if you can find something that will be useful to you. And one more thing before we move on from calm. I am not a vet, obviously, and this is not my area of expertise, but I do, want to mention meds because I have seen so many clients' dogs helped by meds. And so we know that stress for all of us, people, dogs, everybody, um, it impedes learning, it impairs health, and it diminishes quality of life. And so if you wonder if meds might help your dog with some of their behavior issues, ask your vet. Um, Deborah, are there any questions that are specifically about that section? Um, there are a lot of very specific questions. Uh, maybe we save those till. Yeah. One that, that I want to make sure we get to though is yeah. how to stop her dog's growling when her son gets close to mm. her. We're going to get into that a little bit, but let me address it right now always, it never hurts to repeat these important principles. Um, first of all, I, I wish I knew how old her son was. Um, if he is like a toddler, um, there is a program called uh, Family Paws Parent Education. And you can find a trainer who, I, I actually have, am a licensed educator for them. And there's a whole uh, special training you go through to learn how to um, navigate these kind of conflicts between dogs and little kids. Um, if he's a little bit older, a lot of the lessons still apply, but I would encourage you, first of all, again, I'm a broken record, but I really encourage you to, in, to hire a trainer, come to your house, help you work through this. We always say we want to, we never want to punish the growl because the growl is the thing that tells us if we didn't notice any of the other earlier signs of stress, this is the, this is the, the one that tells us, oh, my dog is uncomfortable. 
afraid or frustrated or whatever it is, dogs give us lots and lots of smaller signs. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But a growl is almost kind of the last it's it's kind of like the last ditch effort. It's kind of saying like, mom, I don't know why, but I'm just not comfortable with this little boy being so close to me and maybe petting me when I don't want to be petted or maybe, you know, take picking up my toys or maybe, you know, whatever it is that's happening. The little boy has pure intentions, no doubt. But the dog is going to see that through the lens of, you know, of a dog and won't necessarily understand that, you know, he just wants to hug you or he just wants to um, feel what your whiskers feel like or he just wants to hold your foot or. So we have to really think about um, how we're going to keep everyone at a distance from a safe distance and really supervise um, actively and figure out what specific things are triggering the dog and um, set up the home so that you can manage those interactions so that your son can't just go right up to the dog and do whatever he wants to do. You want to watch your dog and see what he's telling you about whether he's uncomfortable and then step in and um, defuse the situation. And I'll stop there, um, but this is such an important issue and this is something you really wanna get a trainer involved in. And it should be a trainer who has experience with um, working with kids. Um, something else that might help, again, if you go to our website, there is a uh, handout on children and dogs and it's under life with dogs on the menu. Um, Another question is about common collars, like adapter. Ah, and what is the question? Whether it's a good thing? What you think of them. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, who cares what I think? I went to a, um, a workshop at Your Dog's Friend uh, given by one of our very own Virginia-based uh, licensed or uh, board certified veterinary behaviorists. Her name is Dr. Pike and her webinar is on YouTube on your dog's friends channel. And she talked about Adaptil. And, you know, this is something if, if anybody doesn't know, it's a synthetic uh, pheromone that, you know, that, that dogs uh, uh, emit to kind of calm each other. And, and it's got this, you know, just reassuring effect. And, you know, I wondered, like, it's not a prescription, it's an over-the-counter kind of like supplement. But um, Dr. Pike said in her talk that she felt like a puppy or a dog for the first year of its life should be, you know, all puppies should be wearing an adaptive collar um, just because it, it like lowers their, it just kind of takes the edge off um, things that might startle them and, and just enables them to stay, stay calm and you know just have less general anxiety and then it also comes in other forms it comes in uh, a diffuser that you can plug in to an outlet and it also comes in a spray and you'll see there are a lot of vets in our area around here and i'm, I'm sure around the around the country uh that are are certifying their practice as fear-free so, and in those practices, you'll often see, like you can put a bandana on your dog and squirt a little adaptil onto the bandana and it just helps, you know, it just helps soothe them. Um, and I thought if a veterinary behaviorist is telling me that it works, that's good enough for me. <laughs> so yes, I think it's a good, it's a good thing. And I use it with my fearful clients, uh, my, fearful client, uh, my clients, fearful dogs. I think that's it for now. The others are pretty specific and we'll okay. get to the end. All right, good. Okay, so let's talk about communication. This is another of these essential um, kind of ingredients in a good life for a dog. We know that, you know, we want to give, we want to train our dogs and, you know, tell them what we need to, them to do. 
but it's just as important that we learn to read their body language um, and to understand especially their stress signals. This is essential for building your dog's confidence and deepening their trust and giving them a sense of predictability and control. Um, training gives us a shared behavior, right? I don't like to think of training as giving commands. I'm not ordering my dog to sit. I am asking her to sit and she understands what that means because I have taught her and she knows that if she sits, good things will happen. Maybe she'll get a treat. Maybe she'll, you know, we'll play a game of tug or I'll throw her ball. And that's really empowering and reassuring for a dog to be asked to do something that they know how to do and to be motivated to do it because it's always been reinforced in the past. But body language is how dogs talk to us and reading their body language is how we read their emotions and it's how we read their minds. So I, this is not a training class again, but I want to, um, I just want to look at these two behavior, these training cues. I always tell clients, if your dog will always respond when you say his name and will always sit when you ask them to, you're done. You're done training. You got everything you need. And of course, I'm kidding. Kind of. But I think I think it's worth um, really emphasizing these two cues, these two behaviors above all else, because these are like um, they're like master keys that fit into every lock. You can pull these out, your dog's name and sit in almost any scenario and they can prevent almost any unwanted behavior. So here's an example. Um, it's great that your dog recognizes their name, but do they always respond? Maybe, maybe not. Um, we can do better than this, than just recognizing their name. We can teach our dogs to love hearing their name and drop everything the second you say it and tune in to you to hear what wonderful things you have to say to them. Um, so my dog's name is Huckleberry. So I have practiced like crazy for the last eight and a half years of her life. So she pretty much will always um, respond when I say her name. So, which is useful because you need your dog's attention before you give them any more information. And if you can't get your dog's attention, they're not listening. So you can use your dog's name to get their attention. And then this one is, I think this is um, just a crucial concept that because what Huckleberry means when I say it is drop everything, drop what you're doing and tune in because I have something to say to you. And so if you can get your dog's attention and have them stop what they're doing and pay attention to you, then you don't ever have to say no, no, because no doesn't have a meaning, right? Some dogs don't know that they don't even know you're talking to them. Some dogs are just, they're just, it just scares them or it might interrupt them, but it doesn't teach them what they should do instead. <clears throat> so you can use your dog's name instead of no to prevent behavior, to interrupt behavior, and to redirect behavior like counter surfing. You see your dog's nosing around the, <clears throat> the kitchen table and there's a, you know, the dinner leftovers are still out. If you catch them in time, huckleberry, <laughs> and my dog will look at me and I can get her interested in something far away so I can clean up the clean up the food, um, chasing a squirrel. If you can catch them in time, instead of saying, no, you just say your dog's name and they turn to you and then you can toss a treat in the other direction and the squirrel will go up a treat. Um, so all kinds of things. And then last um, thing on my list is it is a foundation for recalls. So when you want your dog to come, first you need to get their attention. And so you know, by building a really strong response to name, you're building a strong foundation for recalls. 
Um, sit is another. Sit is my other go-to behavior. You want your dog to have this as a default behavior. So they sit when they don't know what else to do. They sit when there's nothing going on. They sit when they want something and they are saying, please. Sometimes my dog wants to go across the street and sniff out the uh, recycling bins and I'll wait her out. I'll even, she needs to look at me. Maybe that's enough. Maybe if I really don't feel like crossing the street, I wait for her to sit and sit means, oh, please, I really want to. Sometimes I'll even get her to lie down if she really wants to go. So, but it's a way of saying, please, it's a way of her to communicate. Like, I really want this, could I please have it? Um, and it's incompatible. We use this term incompatible means if they're doing this, they can't do that. If they're sitting, they can't be jumping. If they're sitting, they can't be chasing. So it's really useful, especially with greeting people. If your dog is an enthusiastic greeter and they can't help but jump all over your, you know, 82 year old mother. Um, it also builds impulse control. Sit and wait for your ball. Sit and I'll throw your ball. Sit and I'll give you your food. Sit and we'll go out for a walk. And then it's an, another last thing I wanted to mention is it can prevent over arousal when, do, when a dog is playing, when you're playing with your dog and sometimes they get a little mouthy. And if you intersperse play with sit, then you're going back and forth between ah! and like a very settled behavior. And it teaches this sort of on off switch. Um, so think about that next time you're playing tug and you're getting teeth on your on your fingers. Um, so even if your dog already knows their name and knows how to sit, I really encourage you to just double down on practicing these things and really rewarding them. Don't skimp on the treats because the, the treats are the positive reinforcement that motivates your dog, makes them want to do the thing that you want them to do, even when it was not originally the thing they wanted to do. So then now I want to talk about um, body language and especially stress signals. And it is so important that we listen to what our dogs are telling us. They're always communicating with us through their ears, their eyes, their mouths, their tails, their posture. Um, and we should always be listening because they're telling us how they feel. And if they're not feeling good, we want to get in there and intervene before it gets out of hand. Um, so I, again, I am not going to spend a lot of time on this graphic, this infographic. I have put a link to it in the files part of this webinar platform, but you want to be looking for these little signs. And I, I would say to the, um, the person who said that her dog growls at her son, um, the growl, like I said, is like, kind of a last ditch effort to be to to make a point, right? Before that, he may have been licking his lips, he may have been panting, he may have, you know, yawned, he may have moved away. All these things are just little signs and they're not necessarily intuitive for us because we don't expect we don't express our stress in these ways. But dogs do. And so we need to understand what they're saying so we can you know, step in and help them out. And when they are stressed out and afraid, <laughs> don't judge, you know, <laughs> this is from Bored Panda. Um, yes, I think, you know, it's fun to look at these things. Yeah, are they funny? Yeah, kind of, yeah. I mean, I admit, I, it's, you know, here's a dog. Oh, kittens are scary. And the dog is, you know, 20 times the size of the kittens. And someone might think, well, Good grief, you know, it's a kitten. But think about it. If a dog has never seen a kitten, has never seen four kittens, I don't know how many are actually there. There are four in the picture. It's uh, unfamiliar and therefore a threat. This other dog on the right, he turned three today and was scared of his cupcake. Well, he's probably afraid of the flames, you know, the candles. And if he's never seen a candle, of course he's afraid. So, it doesn't matter if we think it's a threat to your dog, you know, for whatever reason, it is a threat. And for example, my daughter, my 17 year old daughter is terrified of bees. 
I'm not afraid of bees. I used to be, but I got over it, you know, yay for me. But it's um, not going to do any good for me to tell her, now, honey, that bee is not going to sting you. Don't be afraid of it. You can't talk someone out of their fears and you can't, you know, laugh your dog <laughs> out off the chair when they are afraid of a kitten. You just have to understand that these are real fears to them and you need to just help them, help reassure them and help them get over, get over those or just ha make them happen less. So, and that, that sort of leads into this idea of getting a dog's consent and giving them more control of a situation. So a lot of dogs have not had much choice in the things that have been done to them in the past. And so we can be more mindful now about what we do to them, you know, um, in their present life. Um, whenever possible, we want to give them a choice to opt out of something that they don't want to do. Um, you can see this dog is, looks like he's at the vet. He can't really opt out because it's important to go to the vet, but we see that body language, that pulling away the furrowed brow, the clamped jaw. Um, and when we see that kind of body language in our dogs, we know they're stressed and we want to do whatever we can, whatever we can to make it um, less stressful for them. I always bring treats to the vet, but the point is really when you can give your dog a choice, when you can ask for their consent, do that. Um, because that builds their confidence. And it, again, it creates a predictability in their lives. And they learn that they're not going to be forced to do something that they don't want to do. So here's an example. Ah, this kind of drives me crazy, actually. I, I had a client recently who wanted me to um, make her dog um, enjoy meeting people, you know, let, let people pet her dog. And the thing is, um, people always say, you know, can I pet your dog? Is he friendly? And I feel like, ha, you know, th nobody's going to say, no, my dog's not friendly. It's, it's just a judgment. You know, we think all dogs should be friendly to everyone, but some dogs don't want to be petted by a stranger and they should be able to say no. So the question shouldn't be, oh, is your dog friendly? The question should really be for the, for the dog's person, does my dog want this person to pet them? And if they do want that, it's so obvious. The dogs like on the left, these little doodles, whatever they are, they go right up to this person and they, you know, lean into it and they, they approach and they, and they make their intentions clear. Um, and even a timid dog will come over to a person who's, you know, maybe kneeling and not looking directly at them. If they want to come, they will come. On the other hand, the dog on the right, again, the leaning away, the showing the whites of his eyes, the, you know, ears back, the, all of this, this all, everything in this dog's um, appearance is telling us, uh, I don't want you to touch me. So he shouldn't have to, he shouldn't have to be petted, period. And all you need to see is yet your dog is not approaching a person or if they're leaning away, that's a clear sign. So they should have the right to say no. And <clears throat> if you always give a dog who's shy a choice, whether they wanna meet somebody or not, they're gonna learn. They don't have to worry about unwanted attention. And the life becomes more predictable and they feel safe and they feel more confident. And that can start to draw them out of their shell but just kind of pushing it on them it doesn't work very well. It just makes them more so. It's kind of the same with meeting dogs on the street. If your dog is uncomfortable meeting dogs on walks, just don't do it. Um, dogs behave differently on the leash and their body language gets distorted. Um, their options for interacting are limited. They can't run away. They can't, um, they can't get very far when they're on a leash. They can't, 
And so they find themselves in these confrontations. Um, and sometimes it goes well, you know, but even when the greetings go well, that the happy feeling is kind of fleeting. So, you know, and so often they don't go well and the fallout can, you know, can be kind of significant and lasting. You can really create a fear of dogs um, in your dog. You can create reactivity and you can create aggression. And so if your dog doesn't like meeting other dogs, they just shouldn't have to, um, even if you wish they would. <laughs> And um, once your dog learns they're not going to be pressured to interact when they are on a leash, then they can relax and the walks are less triggering and they're more enjoyable. So what do you say if you have committed to, you know, calling off all the would-be petters and, and declining all the offers to meet my dog? What do you say? You have to be your dog's advocate, their bodyguard, their sort of agent, their translator, you kind of have to come up with something that you're going to say. You have to make a plan and stick with it because, you know, we feel bad. Um, someone asks to pet, pet our dog and we have to say no. And we feel like we have to explain, but come up with something. I have clients who just say, no, I'm sorry. He's afraid of, you know, people, or he's afraid of men, or he's afraid of kids. Um, some people say, no, um, he's in training. And, you know, what does that mean? It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it does. I've been told it just kind of, you know, it sort of satisfies people. Okay, never mind. Um, I've even had clients who say, I pretend he's got some disease and that kind of like creeps people out. So you can say, you know, he's contagious. The um, kind of pulling out the big guns, nobody wants to do this, but I wish people were more um, receptive to it. You could put a muzzle on your dog, not because, you know, you want to say, oh, my dog will bite you, but just it automatically causes people to keep their distance. So, um, so this is just a little, you know, frivolous thing about things we do to our dogs that they may not like. And, you know, I just feel like <sighs> we impose on our dogs a lot and, you know, we give them a good life. So they kind of owe us one. If I want to put you in a bunny costume, you know, I'm gonna, but, just know there are some dogs that truly do get a kick out of dressing up and you can see, you can see it. Like look at the dog on the left. Although I'm not sure they haven't just photoshopped that costume onto that dog. I'm not sure, but I have seen dogs who, and a lot of them, a lot of times it's these like pity type dogs and they just, they, they're like, look at me. But this dog on the right, I mean, have you ever seen such a forlorn Easter bunny? So it's just, you know, it's just one of those things ask your dog, do they like wearing a costume? Then yeah, great, go for it. Um, if they don't like wearing a costume, maybe, you know, let them opt out. This is another really important issue and I'm just gonna skim over it, but I hear this all the time. People say, um, oh, um, my dog lets my kids do anything and he's fine, but I just, uh, you know, <laughs> This cute little girl, she's giving her dog a checkup and it's adorable and we want to take a picture and her intentions are good, right? She's just, she's just playing. But I would venture to say, um, this is not as fun for this dog. You can see the ears pulled back, the kind of furrowed brow, the, uh, I mean, this dog probably always has something that looks like a frown um, on his face, but he's got his jaw clamped shut. He's very stiff. He may not be having a great time. He may not be having as much time as his little friend is. So it's just really important to understand the difference between a dog who's just tolerating something, just putting up with it and wishing that it would end, um, and a dog who's truly enjoying this interaction. And, you know, some dogs do. Some dogs will enjoy, you know, playing, having their um, heartbeat, you know, <laughs> listened to through a stethoscope. Um, but try to realize that we can't expect kids and dogs to police themselves or police each other. That's our job. We've got to supervise and we've got to step in when things are kind of going awry. And we want to teach our kids um, or other people's kids to just ask themselves, you know, this is fun for me, but is it fun for the dog? All right. And I'm going to get off my soapbox here, but I just have to put in one more um, one more word about uh, 
you know, about things we do to our dogs that they probably don't like. And some of those things, like we've talked about, some of those things we have to do, we, we have to do them. But when we don't have to do them, let's, let's just give them a break, and let them opt out. So grooming. Do we have to groom our dogs? Well, in some some dogs do need to be groomed. Um, Long-haired dogs uh, have to be groomed so they don't get mats in their fur. Um, some dogs need to be bathed and groomed because they have a skin condition. All dogs need their nails trimmed. So yes, I mean, a certain amount of grooming is going to be important. But what I recommend is if your dog really doesn't like being groomed and bathed, try to at least avoid the big box stores where um, where the training may not be as um, thorough. Get some recommendations from your neighbors. Who do they use? Who's a professional, compassionate groomer who's going to make your dog feel comfortable? You can also have a mobile groomer come to your house and, you know, do things there so that you can be there and they can be in a familiar place. Um, or you can learn how to do these things yourself. Clipping a dog's claws is kind of a harrowing experience, <laughs> but um, you can do it. You can learn how to do this. You can learn how to give your dog a bath. You can learn how to you know, do all sorts of these grooming um, procedures. And then, you know, a, a bath, does your dog really need baths? It's usually just, it's more for us than for them, right? It's really not for them at all. Um, we don't like a smelly dog, right? We want a pretty dog, a shiny, soft dog. And when I was, <laughs> I was in PetSmart the other day and I saw this sign on their grooming area and it said, get them ready for the holiday photos. Ask about our seasonal salon upgrades. And I thought, oh my God, um, my dog, almost never gets a bath. She has really short hair and, you know, I, I just, I have other ways. Um, but I just thought, oh gosh, you know, talk about like asking for consent and uh, giving a dog a chance to opt out. I thought if I asked her if she thought she needed a good thorough scrubbing and a new hairdo for the Christmas card, she would say, no, I'm good. <laughs> no, thanks. So if your dog is stinky and you want to de-stinkify them without putting them, you know, without shampoo and um, water. Just Google smelly dog, no bath, and you'll find all kinds of ways you can actually put baking powder in there or baking soda in their fur and just brush it through and that'll kill some of the stinks. Um, and you can use wipes, wash their bedding, just, you know, look into it. Just think about it. Think about whether your dog really needs a bath. Okay. This is the last um, section that I wanna talk about. And this is something that I think we underestimate, um, the need to use their nose and the sort of deep-seated biological imperative to use their nose to understand their environment. So, um, Dogs need outlets for doing dog things, for doing their hardwired instinctive behaviors. And their nose is like, is as important to them as our eyes are for us. We mostly look around us to see what's going on and make sense of what's happening. And dogs smell to figure out, you know, what's the story and what's, what's happening here. So when they have opportunities to use their nose for what it's, you know, for what it's meant for. It's, it's really fulfilling an, an, an essential behavioral need. And when we don't give them chances to sniff, it's really frustrating. Um, their sense of smell is their superpower. They, dogs can be trained to detect a cadaver under up to 30 meters of water. Okay. Orkin, the pet, the, the pest control company uses dogs to sniff out bed bugs. Um, they could smell cancer on a person's breath. They probably can detect COVID-19. Um, there's been some research uh, with pro promising preliminary results. So 
when you're on a walk, this is why your dog keeps stopping and stopping and sniffing and sniffing and stopping and sniffing. And, you know, I have clients who say to me, this is terrible. He's not getting enough exercise and I'm not getting any exercise. And the thing is, exercise isn't just physical, right? It's also mental. And when you give your dog a chance to, to smell their smells, um, you're fulfilling that need. And, um, like I said, it's just, it's hardwired and it, they also, you can see they, they really enjoy it. And so, you know, I kind of feel like the smells are probably their favorite thing about walks. And so I see so many people like yanking their dogs and dragging their dogs away from the things that they want to smell so that they can move along, move along. And, um, I just encourage you to really think about, you know, being patient and indulging your dog's kind of need to explore scents. I, I think of it like this. I think of it like a trip to the museum and this, all the smells are the exhibits or the artwork and your dog is, you know, appreciating it and taking it in. And it's like if you go to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and you know, you want to take your time appreciating the paintings and the sculptures and, you know, but you brought along this companion and they just keep hassling you along and they're impatient and they, they just, you know, they just, they just want to get over it. They just want it to be over and they want to get it done. And wouldn't you feel a little cheated, you know, like why even go to the museum if you're not going to have time to, you know, savor, if you're going to be rushed past all the interesting stuff. And they have to think that a dog kind of feels like, why don't we even go for a walk if I don't get to sniff? So there's on walks, they'll have lots of opportunities to sniff. But another way you can incorporate scent work into your dog's life is you don't ever need to feed them out of a food bowl, really. Um, left to their own devices out in the world, they would spend a huge amount of their time just kind of using their nose to search for food. When we give them a, their food in a bowl, there's no work involved, right? They just eat it and then they're done and then there's nothing else to do. So what I like to do is use at least part of your dog's breakfast and dinner for scent games. And one of the things you can do is you can um, just, you know, if you have a yard or if you go to a park, you know, if maybe you have a longer leash and you just scatter dry food or treats or, you know, even just your dog's kibble, just scatter it into the grass. And this is, my dog in my yard and I have put her in the yard and then I go upstairs and I open a window and I throw a handful of kibbles into the grass and just scatter it everywhere. And she will spend however long it takes to find every last one. And then she'll come in and take a nap. So um, I have one more thing. It's not really all. I have one more thing. I want to show you a video. Um, this is going to be a video of just a little part of an indoor scavenger hunt that I do with my dog <laughs> every day. We, we hide her food around all around the house. And this is something that you can do too, if you're willing to hide food around your house. Um, I find most dog people are willing to do this. It's a lot of fun to hide the food and then it's so much fun for a dog to find it. So, um, one more thing I want to say is pardon the mess of my house. I would be lying if I said this is not normal. It's always like this. So let's see. Okay, here we go. So this is Huckleberry. This is an um, the egg holder from the refrigerator. And now she's looking, she's smelling. There's the food. Is it in here? Nope. Where else? Oh, there's some in the box. It's hard to get out because it's like, stuck down under the flap because I like to challenge her. Oh, there's something. Oh, there's something in the drawer. I taught her to pull it and open it and I always hide food in there. Well, maybe there's some back here. And sorry, I ended with a shot of my dog's butt. So, and that is, now we've come to the end. So if you have questions, I'm happy to take them now. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Actually went a little bit over what I wanted to. I wanted to keep it to an hour because I didn't want anybody to get bored. But if you're not too bored, 
yet <laughs> you want to stick around for questions, I would be happy to um, take them now. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, one, one person, Patricia, said that diffusers, oils, et cetera, are not safe. And then someone else asked about calming herbal supplements for older dogs and whether Adaptil is only for puppies. Mm, no, Adaptil is not only oh, there. Yeah. There is another version. I mean, there's a like a there's one for puppies and there's one for older dogs. Well, I didn't hear the first um, um, diffusers and oils and things whether or not they're safe. Oh, well, I. I just go back to what I said. Dr. Pike recommends, you know, these products. I don't know if there's, see, I mean, I don't know if the, I don't know. I haven't heard that. Uh, it's worth looking into. I can't answer the question. I wish I could. Okay. I can look into it for you. And someone else got a retired Greyhound about three weeks ago. And the problem they're having, he's doing fine with other dogs, except small dogs that they mm. oh. And she wants to know if you can go over how to recognize when he wants to play versus when the small dog is like prey. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to, t you know, I, I think I would be, it would be irresponsible of me to, um, to make any kind of declarations about how to tell the difference. Um, I think that's something that has to be observed by an expert. So the safest thing, and I assume she's talking about on leash. Um, and I, you know, as I said before, I hate to be a killjoy, but I'm not a big fan of dogs meeting each other on a leash um, because it often just doesn't go well. And if a dog is going to play, to truly play with another dog, it's not gonna be on a leash. Um, and so, you know, unless you have a carefully managed setting where you could have them play, then, you know, if it, the, the better way is probably to just avoid the, um, the interaction and work on getting, keeping the greyhound's attention on, on their person, on, on the person who asked the question and just kind of minding their own business. Um, and again, you know, I'm going to say a trainer can help you understand the body language and kind of interpret what may or may not be going on in, in your dog's head. But if they're getting aroused, you know, like, you know, pulling and, eh, you know, it, it just violates the like stay calm rule that I have. And I don't know. I, I just think it's worth it, it hiring a trainer if it's a big concern. Um, but it, it may be, I mean, some greyhounds are, that some dogs in general are, um, do see small dogs as, as, you know, it just triggers their prey, um, instinct, predator instinct. Diane wrote that she has three rescues, two that they've had for several years. The third they just adopted after fostering. Everyone got along well for the first eight weeks. Now the new dog, a uh, one and a half year old, getting to resource guard the humans. Mm. Doesn't want other dogs to get on the sofa with us and doesn't growl, but does a hard stare. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, it's great that you recognize those signs. Um, and yeah, that can happen. Uh, my dog does that too. <laughs> and there are, ugh, I'll be honest, multi-dog families are not my area of expertise. And they are, um, there are trainers that do a lot of work with multi-dog households. I have a multi-species household. I have two cats, one of whom is blind. I have a guinea pig who's sometimes free range and a rabbit who's mostly free range. And so I like to you know, manage those interactions, but I... I don't, I, I'm glad that you recognize the resource guarding and you've caught it early. And that I would recommend, you know, again, I would recommend a trainer who come to your house and look at your specific, the, you know, how your house is set up and the specific behavior that you're seeing. Um, and, you know, how to prevent, how to, a lot of it is management because 
it's, you know, it's, it's hard to train dogs to feel a different way about each other. Um, the way we sometimes can with, with how they feel about people. So a lot of it's going to be just preventing those stressful interactions. And I think your best bet is just to, to really talk to a trainer who, who, uh, specializes in, um, tension in the household. We are going to have a webinar in the winter on um, multiple dog households. Oh, that's great. Uh, I will do there. <laughs> I will, I will benefit from that because yeah, I don't. It's um, not going to be for a few months. Well, I'll, I'll be here. So, <laughs> okay. um, and then there's some questions about smelling. Um, what about the dog that wants to sniff out dead small animals or trash they want to eat. The dog that does chew everything, acorn sticks, rabbit poop. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. So, so that's a couple different things, right? Um, it, part of it is we think it's gross. Um, and we don't want to have a dog who does gross things. <laughs> and, Fair enough. You know, you set the rules. It's your dog. In that case, you kind of need to work on, um, you know, your dog's um, leave it behaviors and, um, you know, just do things to kind of prevent them from getting um, involved in in uh, investigating trash or dead animal. And before they get too invested in it, you can use treats to lure them away or you can, you know, call their name and interrupt and redirect. Um, I tend to be a much more permissive dog person than um, some other people might be. I find that my dog, can, my dog's stomach can handle a lot of things. Um, so that has put me at ease about, you know, if she eats uh, a stick, it, you know, some dogs eat mulch. You know, I always ask my clients who have these issues, what do you notice about their digestion after they eat something that you think they shouldn't have eaten? And if they have a sensitive stomach, um, you're going to want to prevent them from eating the things that give them digestive problems. But if they don't have problems, you know, remember dogs have the gut, the digestive system of a scavenger. Yes, they hunt, you know, they, they can chase and kill things, but they're built to scavenge. And that means they're built to eat stuff that may not be the thing kind of thing that you would want on your dinner table, but they can handle, you know, they can handle some nasty stuff and they have a stomach that, that makes it very easy for them to puke it up if it doesn't agree with them. So, you know, so it's two things. It's like, number one, if you don't want them sniffing certain things, you're going to have to, you know, work on preventing them from from pulling you over there um, or train them a good leave it so that they will, you know, abandon all hope of smelling the recycling bin. But if you are willing to let them use their nose for the things that interest them the most, and it results in like, yeah, eating a piece of rabbit poop. Uh, my dog has eaten rabbit poop in my house. It doesn't seem to make any difference at all <laughs> in her, you know, so I don't get too exercised about those things. So it's really, it's up to you. I mean, there are certain things a dog shouldn't eat like chocolate and, you know, medicine and um, grapes and, uh, you know, there's a whole list, but if it's out in nature and it doesn't upset your dog's stomach, I always just let them sniff. Um, Wendy wrote twice, so it's gonna take me a minute to get it all out there. But okay. adopted a black lab mix when she was seven months old. She's now 15 months. She's 70 pounds of muscle. <sighs> yeah. Okay. Who comes relentless yeah. when she attempts to discipline her. Um, hmm. So, yeah, the um, word discipline, but also. Yeah. And relentless. What is. Mm. I think I'm not going to be able to answer that question without some more. Um, let me see Without. where the follow-up is. Okay, she followed up with, she continues to go after her and other people's feet. She does not let go. 
Hmm. She is so strong that it's hard to get away from her. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Um, so again, this is obviously, this is a concern that you have um, and it's a problem and it's something that you need a trainer to work with you on. But what that behavior says to me is there's um, sort of over arousal going on. And I don't know what the circumstances are that trigger that kind of behavior, but sometimes frustration, sometimes um, just like uh, over arousal during play. Sometimes it's just, you know, for whatever reason, a dog um, who gets into this kind of state of arousal, it can be, it, it doesn't have to be, um, reactivity it can just be like, ah, you know, it's just a heightened state. It's a heightened, um, emotional and physiological state of activation. And so when dogs are aroused, they're in that fight or flight, even if they're not afraid, they're in that fight or flight mode of, of the, you know, the brain is not in thinking, learning, making good choices mode. It's just, you know, ah, and so you need to be able to kind of snap them out of that. Um, and also just kind of understand what is, what is causing the dog's hyper arousal to begin with and how you might, you know, kind of change the, change the environment or change the, you know, your activities or change the setup of your house or whatever it is to kind of keep that arousal in check and practice relaxation and practice calm. And sometimes if you're really desperate, you can just take a handful of treats and throw them away from your foot. And you might think, why on earth would I reward this behavior? But if you are seeing that your dog cannot disengage, they're not learning, they're not thinking, they're just they're just kind of like in this fugue state where they can't, all they can do is keep chewing on your shoe. And what you wanna do is break that off because what you're saying is there's nothing you can do to break it off. This will break it off. You know, get, have a handful of hot dogs, put it on your dog's nose and throw it away from you because that's gonna break off. That's gonna, and cause they'll use their nose to find them. And that will at least snap them back into thinking mode and then you've got some room to, you know, to, to engineer the situation so that can't continue to happen. But again, I would get a positive trainer to come in there and, and you know, see what's happening and give you some solutions. Someone else asked what seems like a similar question. Um, a hyperactive dog that has a bad barking, biting problem. Mm. Um, a bad barking and what problem? Biting. 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 Okay. Uh, I, I'm guessing that means mouthing. Um, but again, yeah, it's it's this hyper arousal effect, and you know, like we talked about earlier in the you know in in our discussion, there are all kinds of reasons why dogs may have um, developed these. Um, or like not develop these skills of kind of self-regulating. And some dogs just aren't very good at kind of having an off switch. Um, and that's why, you know, you want to train them to have these settled behaviors like sit. You want to practice relaxation and calm. Um, but you also really want to look at, you know, look at trigger stacking, which we talked about earlier. You know, is there... Even, you know, I, I, I was thinking about even going for a walk, you know, for, for a lot of dogs, maybe most dogs, a walk is enjoyable and it discharges a lot of energy. Um, it provides a lot of mental stimulation. And when they come home from a walk, they feel, you know, satisfied and maybe they go take a nap or hang out on their, you know, dog bed or whatever, whatever they do, they, they seem, you know, serene and you know, fulfilled, but some dogs come back from a walk more amped up than they were when they left. And it's because of, 
you know, all these triggers that they keep encountering, or they're just getting overstimulated, overstimulated. And I don't know if that has anything to do with the, with the, you know, mouthing and the barking. Um, but it's just something to think about. It's think about the triggers that your dog is encountering. And if it's on a walk, you might need to make the walks shorter, maybe more frequent, but shorter. Um, and then just, you know, when you get barking and mouthing, that's just a sign of arousal. And, you know, you want to help your dog find, you know, you want to practice relaxation so they can learn to be calm. But again, you know, get a trainer to help you to look at the specific instances where this is happening and, um, and give you some strategies to mitigate it. Okay, Denise wants to know about her dog who play bites. And she says she's moved away and ignored her and she continues to follow her mm -hmm. and around her to stand or jump in front of her. Yeah. A persistent dog. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I haven't seen what this behavior looks like, but I've seen it in other dogs. And I have my clients, I often have my clients send me a video of the behavior. So what, before I meet them, so that when I meet them, I have some sense of, you know, is this kind of a problem behavior? You know, is it, is it, a, is, it a, um, is it dangerous or is it, you know, just a different like interpretation of what play is? And often you see these dogs who are like, really, you know, mouthy and nippy and overwrought during play, they, um, if you push them away, that's fun. And if you make a little squeal, that's exciting. And if you, you know, kind of walk away from them, that's fun too. They'll follow you. So the, the reason this keeps happening, you know, this kind of behavior that you don't like is because there's something reinforcing about it to the dog. There's something that your dog really enjoys. And part of it is probably just poor ability to self-regulate. So what I always recommend is alternate play with um, settled behaviors, like teach your dog to sit, teach them to lie down, teach them to give you eye contact, all of those things. And then while you're playing, play for you know even just 30 seconds stop, ask your dog to sit, ask your dog to, you know, watch me, ask them to lie down and then go back to playing another 30 seconds. If that's, if that's all they can handle is 30 seconds of, you know, um, of like uh, frantic play before they're like flipping their lid, 30 seconds is enough and then have them settle. And, you know, so you go back and forth between play and calm. So it's like, on switch, off switch. Um, and that helps build impulse control. Also, I, I've had a lot of clients recently with this issue. Um, and one thing that you need to do uh, right away is as soon as the behavior turns to something that you don't like, you have to end the interaction immediately. Like sometimes with a physical, it's good to have like an X pen, you know, a folding fence or something, or just some so that and you like you stay calm, but just play stops. You want to teach your dog the second you start this, just a little short amount of time, and then give them another opportunity to play nice. And as long as they're playing nice, you go back to, you know, play, sit, watch me, play, lie down. And um, if it starts to happen again, then, you know, Understand that you probably should have stopped sooner, but also, you know, cut it off. Don't let it, don't let it continue because it's fun for your dog. That's why they're doing it. Um, so just be firm, but not firm, like physically, just like play stops. You broke the rules. I don't want to play with you. 30 seconds. Let's try again. Um. There's a comment that deer poop dead animals may have diseases. Mm. And someone else said, you recommend a muzzle for a dog that eats poop and sticks and wet mud and insects. On your leave it. Um, 
So yeah, no, I agree. Um, but the, the second, oh, I just, oh, muzzle. Okay, so I love a muzzle. I wish everyone would muzzle train their dogs because it's great for preventing a lot of, a lot of behaviors. Um, and if it is really a problem, like a health problem or just a severe issue that you really cannot tolerate, then a muzzle is okay. Um, it will prevent some of that. But the thing is that uh, the kind of muzzle that you want to use the most humane um, kind of muzzle is a basket muzzle. And the reason they're humane is because they're easy to, you know, your dog can still breathe well, they can drink and they can eat. So if you have a muzzle that is the most humane type of muzzle to train your dog to, it may not prevent the eating the things you don't want them to eat. Um, and I wouldn't use a different kind of muzzle. So. It's, it, yeah, I, I don't know. It's not my favorite idea, but you could look into it a little bit more with, uh, with some expert advice. When I look at the questions, um, I want to encourage people to go to our website and look in three different places. One is look at the videos of past webinars and workshops. Yeah. Other is there's a section called behavior issues. And for example, we have reactivity to dogs, reactivity to people. And these are very quick reads. Um, it, it, they're good for overviews. Um, and the third was there's also under life with dogs. Some of what I mentioned is under there. So you know, if you look around our website, you can find a lot of answers to get you started while you wait to see a positive trainer or a veterinary behaviorist. You can also write to us at uh, your dog's friend information at gmail.com. Most of the other questions I see here really require uh, you know, more specific answers from a trainer. So I, I don't think we should get into them now. Um, but um, Nicole just put up your dog's friend information at gmail.com. She does answer more specific questions and she will give you referrals. So that's one way to go. Um, Karen, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Deborah. I, I love what you do, and I love having the chance to connect with people about these important um, issues. Okay. And everyone else, I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.